Hey, it's great to be back with you once again for another uh, message, another time where we're going to come together and worship God through song as well as exalt Him through uh, the um, teaching of His Word and just spending time. Super excited about today as always. Uh, we're wrapping up a little mini series here and then uh, the following week we will be in Palm Sunday. Easter is coming upon us. And so... Um, so today we're going to talk about a really uh, cool story and talking about seeing things in black and white. And I think you're going to be uh, very uh, challenged and intrigued by the story that we have uh, today. But before we do that, let me just open us up with a word of prayer. And then we will begin our time with uh, praising and exalting Jesus through song. So if you would, bow your heads and your hearts. And I'm just going to open up our time with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this awesome day. Thank you that we can gather together in spirit and truth and worship you and exalt your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that's exactly what would happen today. Through all that we sing, uh, may it just reflect the joy that we have in our hearts for you. Uh, and, and as we spend time in the teaching of your word, may we encounter you and see you reveal yourself even more to us uh, through, through your word. So we just pray uh, that all that we do and say today would ultimately bring you glory. And it's in the most powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, that we pray and ask these things. Amen and amen.
Well, uh, we are going to be wrapping up uh, this series, uh, which is a little mini series, which uh, focused on uh, Je- encounters with Jesus, how individuals had some different encounters with Jesus and, and um, what that looked like and, and the difference that it made in their lives, the profound difference that it made in their lives as they encountered uh, the, living, the living God, right? So today we're going to take a look at another one, some, a, a story that's probably very familiar to you if you've been in church for a while. I think it's a great, I think it's a great story. Um, it's a very powerful story. Uh, but but as we do that, well, the first thing I want to share with you is this. I think it's going to wreck some of your guys' lives that see things in black and white, okay? Now, that's very hard when I say that, okay? Uh, and what I mean by that is, um, with the Bible, um, I do see things black and white as well. However, there seems to be, once we get into um, just living out our spiritual lives, everything's not just black and white, it seems like there's some gray in there. I like photography. I love photography. And one of the things that's very challenging within photography is controlling the light. Uh, Because with a camera, what a camera will do, it will read the darkest of dark and the lightest of light, okay? It takes in all of that brightness and darkness. Uh, The darkness would be called shadows. The light would be called your highlights, Okay, and so what happens is if you use your camera just on auto where it chooses all the same or chooses all the settings for you, what it will do is it will read the entire light that's coming into the lens and it will average it out and it averages it out to a basic gray. Okay, that's why when you take pictures when it's too bright, when it's like extremely bright outside. Um, uh, you won't have any shadows, but your your it'll just your 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 picture will be kind of bright. You won't everything will just kind of it won't look like what you saw with your eyes. Okay, and so there's times where. Uh, times in the day where if you if you shoot during times of the day, um, certain times of the day, it'll just blow out your picture. It'll be super bright or it'll be, it'll be really kind of dark. And so the way around that is you start learning how to manipulate the camera. You start shooting in manual. You use a light meter per, perhaps uh, with your digital cameras or some other things you can use that's on board there that you can, uh, that you can use to, to make your images look really nice. But part of that is uh, picking out, picking the right part of the day to to shoot a picture, right? Now, I share that with you to say this, when when a camera averages it out, it averages out to a gray is what it does. It doesn't see what you're looking at. It doesn't take into consideration that the cloud, that, that this over here is supposed to be bright, this over here is supposed to be darker. It doesn't know that. It doesn't have a brain to know that. All it does is take it all in and average it out, okay, to like a gray. So that's what I'm going to, uh, today as we look at this passage of scripture, that's what we're going to kind of see here in a sense, if I could say it that way, for some of us, it's like, no, it's either black or it's white. Well, we're going to see in a passage of scripture here from Jesus' teaching, from an encounter with Jesus, that um, all things aren't black and white. And that's how the Pharisees were presenting this little situation to Jesus, because they wanted to catch him. They wanted to uh, catch him in a trap, and so that's what they do. They use they use a, they, they 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 design this trap to set up Jesus because Jesus uh, was starting to gain popularity with the people. He was starting to teach. Uh, vastly different than what they, the kind of what they believed in a sense. He started referring to himself as God, right? As, as the Father, I am. And so throughout the Gospel of John, he makes seven I am statements, which he's saying, I am God. I am the creator of the world. I am. And so he's, in their eyes, he was, he was, for, and for people who, uh, wouldn't even pronounce the name of God Yahweh. They they would they thought it was so sacred even to pronounce his name that they wouldn't even say it. And yet you have this Jesus figure coming along saying that he is God. So they had huge issues with that. Okay, so they tried to trap him, and that's what we're going to read about today. But there's something. But I want us to see a very powerful message, a very powerful encounter that comes uh, from this situation with Jesus. So if you would turn with me to John chapter 8, we're going to take a look at, again, a passage, a story that uh, you may have uh, be, familiar, be very familiar with, um, but it's just a very powerful story that we're going to use as our last message for this little mini-series, and then we'll be going into uh, Palm Sunday. So with that being said, in John chapter 8, 
We're going to break this down into three different sections. We're going to look at the law, we're going to look at the love, and we're going to look at the light. Okay, Those are the three different sections that we're going to see within this particular passage of Scripture. So in John chapter 8, let's just, and we're going to read down a few verses and then stop and then kind of continue on, so please keep your Bibles open there with me. So it says, um, it, let's start in verse 2 of chapter 8 of John. It says this, At dawn he went to the temple complex again, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and he began to teach them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They asked this to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. Jesus stooped down, started writing on the ground with his finger. When they persisted in, the question, in questioning him, he stood up and said to, the, said to them, the one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. When they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman in the center, meaning Jesus. Verse 10, when Jesus stood up, he said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. And so, very interesting story here, okay? Very interesting story. Jesus is teaching. They try to, they try to trap him with his teaching, okay? And so they bring this woman to him that's supposedly caught in adultery. Now, a couple things that's very interesting, or one thing that's very interesting about this passage of Scripture is, number one, are they just, is this, is this woman somewhat scantily clad, clothed? Do they just kind of pull her out of the situation and say, we just, it's kind of like a Monty Python movie here in a sense. You know, they kind of grab this woman, they bring her in. Does she just have a sheet on? Is she like almost naked? What, I mean, how, how far into this do we, do we look? She was caught into adultery. Second of all, where's the guy at? Where was the man? Where's the man at that she would have uh, been interacting with that would have, that would have promulgated this, this, um, this, this, offense where they're saying she was caught in adultery. So and nevertheless, he's in the temple courts, it says. So the way I read this, he's in the temple courts. He's teaching. People are gathering around, right? They gathered around. He sat down. He begins to teach him. And then all this combust, all this, this, this commotion starts with the scribes and the Pharisees as they drag in this woman caught in adultery. And they sit and they kind of throw her in the center. And they're saying, this woman was caught in Adultery. Can you imagine how humiliated she must have been? Now, again, she would have known the law. She would have known that it was wrong to do what she was doing, the, the act that she was uh, engaging in. She would have known that it was wrong. She would have also have known the offense to that or, or the, um, the, the, um, the penalty of that offense would have been to be stoned to death. And that means they would have literally taken her out to a place. They would have literally... Now, just think about this for a second. They would have begun to pick up rocks and literally begin to throw rocks at another human being, which would have been, what, within 10 feet, 5 feet, 6 feet? I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you're not lofting rocks from 25 yards out, right, trying to hit someone. I think it would have been very close. It would have been a very close interaction that would have taken place where they literally start picking up rocks and literally started throw, starting to throw rocks at another human being and hitting them with rocks until they're dead, until they're literally dead. Like, like it was an insect or something. Like it was something that you wouldn't value their life that much for, like a spider. Some of you get freaked out about spiders and have no problem killing a spider whatsoever, right? But they would do this with another human being. I just can't imagine this. So here she is, and she, this would have been the offense. That would have been the... Um, that would have been the penalty of her offense, right? So she's out in the middle, and they begin to, to question Jesus. Now, that was the law. The law of Moses said that if anyone would have gotten caught into in, in adultery, that the, the penalty was to stone them. That was the law of the time. They knew that. Jesus knew that. The people knew that. The woman knew that. 
But they're trying to trick him because Jesus was teaching about love, right? Jesus was teaching about forgiveness. Jesus was teaching about praying for your enemies. Jesus was teaching about having a heart for people, having loving God and loving others. Okay, so Jesus' message was all about love, love, love. So think about it. Again, this is a black and white question from the perspective of the scribes and the Pharisees. This woman was caught in adultery. What do you say that we do? Right? What do you say, Jesus? And they probably stood there like, hmm? What do you say that we do? Because if he would have said, yes, stone her, that's what the law says, then they would have trapped him and said, see, you know, you're not about love, right? They would have, they would have um, caught him kind of in a, in a, in a trap in a sense of what he taught. If he would have said, no, I want you to love the, love her and forgive her, then they would have said, well, you don't care about the law of Moses. That, my friend, is a black and white question. But I find it very interesting that Jesus didn't engage from that perspective. But before we jump into that, let's just talk about that for a second, okay? Let's talk about this because when we, when this whole, this whole concept of of the law, what the law does is the law reveals our guilt. Okay. That was the whole nature of the law. The Ten Commandments, the law that they had, the nature of the law, the intent of the law was to show the guilt, was to show how that we were not righteous, to show how we were not okay, to show that things are not right. Okay. So the law was there to point to that. The law could not forgive. The law could not provide righteousness. The law, all the law, all that the law did was to show the guilt. The law reveal, reveals guilt. Now, let me ask you this question. Have you ever, you know, just a question. Have you ever stolen something? Is there something ever in your life, have you ever taken something that didn't belong to you, that wasn't yours? Okay? Have you ever taken God's name in vain? We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Sometimes, you know, we view taking God's name as get, taking God's name in vain is saying His name in a way that bring you know that that's not that's not in a recep, recep, uh, respectable, um, holy, uh, worthy way, right? We take God's name in vain where we add some things to it, and we just take. There's another way of looking at that as well is when we say that we're a Christian and we received His free gift of grace and salvation. We don't live up to that, and so what we communicate to the world is something different than what the way a Christian conducts themselves, and that can be a way that you take God's name in vain, in vain because you bring embarrassment to God, okay? So my question is, has there ever been a time in your life, ever a time in your life where you might have said God's name improperly, the way you shouldn't have said it, or has there ever been a way that you've conducted yourself in public where when someone looked at you, they saw something that, 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 wasn't, that didn't quite measure up to the way God would have you to live your life, the way a Christian would live his live your life. That is living in vain. Have you ever looked lustfully at someone? Have you ever just looked lustfully at someone? Now, let's break it down here for a second. If you've told a lie, what does that make you? That makes you a liar, right? So, you know, if you've taken God's name in vain, we call that blasphemy. If you look lustfully at a woman that that or a man or whatever and you're married, that means you've committed adultery within your heart, correct? That's what Jesus taught. You're an adulterer now, okay? So now we've become these lying, um, thieving, we've stole some thieving, blasphemous adulterers, right? I mean, that's humanity. That's where we're at, okay? So here's the deal. If if we never understand, if you never understand that you're broken, if you never understand that you're in process, if you never understand that you're human, that, that you have, that you still have a human nature that wars against, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, a fleshly nature that wars against the spirit, those two natures that Paul talks about inside of us. If you never recognize that you're a sinner, if you never recognize that you break the law from time to time and why that is so important, because if you don't ever recognize that, then you're never going to understand the need for a Savior. And it's not just a one and done thing. It's not a one and done thing that says, oh no, I need a Savior for salvation. But what about the in-between time? What about not just from the past to the future, but what about the present? 
Are you telling me now that you never struggle with any of these things? That you never struggle with telling a little white lie? That you never struggle out of having anger? You never struggle at looking at something and having, having covetous eyes or lustful eyes or whatever? I, you name it, whatever it is. I don't know. Whatever it could be. That's not the point. The point is the law reveals guilt. And if we never understand that, if we never see ourselves as broken individuals or individuals in process where we still need God on a daily basis, His righteousness covering us on a daily basis, then we're never going to understand the need for a Savior. Okay? The law always reveals our guilt. The law said that this woman was guilty. She was guilty. Okay? Now, Jesus, as we read in the Scripture, as they brought her before them, or before Jesus, and present her offense, what does Jesus do? He doesn't say a word. He doesn't say a word, but yet he stoops down and he begins to write something, you know, uh, write something down. And that's what it means in the, in the English. It says to write down. That's what it means in English. But there's two words there. And the two words, one of them is graph graphene and the other, the other is catagraphene. Graphene means to write something down. That's what he was doing literally. You know, when you translate that, that's what it is. The, the graphene means that he was literally writing something down. But the word used here in our text is catagraphene, um, and which means to write down a record against. To write down a record against someone, an offense that's been made. That's the word, to write down a record against. That's the word that's being used here. And so Jesus, God being in flesh, 100% man, 100% God, uh, God being in flesh, He knows all things. He knew all things, right? He knew the interiors of these individuals. He knew these men. Now, I, this is just kind of speculation what theologians have thought because the Bible doesn't tell us what He wrote down. It doesn't say anything. He could have just been doodling in the sand, whatever. But it seems to indicate, people seem to, People seem to think that what he was writing down was something, probably, possibly um, their sins, okay? Like some of the offenses that they had made, some of the offenses that they had done that they're harboring, that he knew that was in the interiors of their hearts, okay? So as we look at this, you know, that, you know, possibly that's what he was writing down. He was writing down these offenses, okay? And he was writing down uh, some of the things that they were saying. In verse 7, it says this, When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let anyone, if you look at verse 7 there with me, he says, um, in fact, that's the first thing he says, he says, The one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Okay, now look at that verse again. The one without sin among among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Now what's very interesting is that when when we if you would do a proper translation of that that says uh, you know my my scripture says the one without sin okay the one without sin if the proper translation mean it doesn't mean just without sin okay it, it it goes beyond that there's more meaning to that in the Greek it literally means without even wanting to sin. You notice how Jesus always takes everything to the next level? You know, you know you, you're told, you know, it's been said an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth, and I'm telling you that's not the way it is. I'm telling you, you know, um, if you even, you know, not to murder, but if you even look at someone with a certain way, with anger in your heart, that you've murdered them. If you, again, back to the adultery, uh, uh, if you look at someone with lustful eyes, even though you haven't committed it, you still have committed it because you've committed it within your heart. It's the same thing that he's saying here. Those of you without sin, not just you don't have any sin within your life, but even further to the next level, you don't even have the desire without even wanting to sin. Isn't that powerful? And so Jesus really leans into it. And Jesus is going after something that's really, really important here. Something that we really need to lean into. He's not being judgmental. I think these guys are being extremely judgmental. They're being very arrogant, but he's leaning into them to say, you've overlooked something. You've overlooked what's in your life. But that's what's easy for us to do, isn't it? It's always easy for us to look into someone else's life and see what's going on with their lives, but it's very hard to look into ours. In fact, I have multiple conversations with people, and I think it's very unempathetic. I think it's very insensitive. I think it's very judgmental, in a set, uh, to say the least, 
The, and I've heard this quote before, and I really like the way it says it. It's like, it's easy for us to look at someone as a book, and we jump into their chapter 6, but we have no clue what's going on in chapters 1 through 5 to give chapter 6 context. All we see is chapter 6, and because I see chapter 6, and I'm not giving any consideration to any of this back here, I'm jumping in because I can see something that's happening within their lives. I think that is so insensitive, and I think that's so unsympathetic or empathetic, I should say, to do to other believers or to other individuals, to say the least. But what Jesus is saying here is this. He's saying, you without first without sin, you be the first to throw the stone. You, the one without sin, the one without even desiring to sin, then you're in a good position. You take the stone. You be the first one to throw the first stone. And I think it's very interesting. The first person that leaves, we start with the older ones and kind of trickle down to the younger ones, right? And I can just imagine, you know, them standing there thinking about this, you know, just thinking about it. And Jesus asks that question and really puts them on the spot. I could just be like think, hearing them <laughs> think in their minds like, you know what? I don't need any of this. I'm out. I'm done. I don't need any of this. This is ridiculous. I'm out of here. Right? And rightfully so. So as these men begin to think about it and they begin to walk off and they begin to, you know, go their separate ways, the only person that's left is this woman before Jesus. And I think it's very interesting that Jesus looks up and he asks the woman, he says, so where are your accusers? Where are the ones that were condemning you? And she says they've all left. If you look in that passage of Scripture down here, it's the second time Jesus kind of he interacts. Um, he stands up and he says, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she says, No one, Lord. I think it's interesting she uses the word Lord there. No one, Lord, she answered. answered. And then he says this, Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on do not sin anymore. What grace comes in. The law reveals guilt. The love of Jesus just gives this enormous amount of grace. The grace that only Jesus, Jesus doesn't condemn. You know, this is, this is the thing. This is, so uh, Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. I think this is very interesting because even in, I don't know how, if you want to word it in counseling, if you want to word it engaging it with other individuals when you're talking to other Christians and things like that, you don't want them to feel condemned. You're not going after them to say, hey man, these are the things that you're doing in your life that's wrong. And they, be, they may come forth and tell you those things. They may, it may be very apparent. The fruit that they're producing may be very apparent that what they're engaging in is wrong. You're not judging them. You're not, you're not judging them. You're just, you're, you're seeing the fruit of their actions. You're seeing the fruit of their heart, right? So, um, and, and, and in various situations, uh, with the woman at the well, this particular situation, Jesus never brought condemnation to the person, but he did force them to look at their life. He did for, he, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the guy that laid there for 38 years by the pool in Bethesda to be healed. And Jesus says, do you want to be well, right? Later on, he tells the guy, don't sin anymore. But he brings that guy to the point of showing him, you've got sin in your life. It's time, to, it's time to get rid of it. It's time to stop it, okay? The woman at the well, he didn't condemn her by saying, hey, you know, this is your situation. She brought it up and he, and he said, yeah, you're right. You're living, with, you know, you've lived with X amount of husbands and the one you live with right now is not even yours, right? And so he didn't condemn. He didn't bring condemnation, but he brought grace and love. But he didn't steer away from it. He didn't shy away from it. He was showing them that this is the life that you've chosen. This is the path that you've chosen. And because you've chosen this path, it's bringing destruction within your life. However, my path is not going to bring that type of destruction. It's, not, it's going to bring you freedom. It's going to bring you life. It's going to bring you dignity and value what you're truly searching for. Jesus didn't condemn, but he did show them. He brought them to see what the actions of their voice were. He wasn't the accuser. We do have an accuser. Uh, Revelation 12, I believe, tells us who our accuser is. It's Satan. But Jesus isn't the one. He brought light to it, but he wasn't the one that was bringing condemnation. He was bringing, he was bringing um, grace and love to the situation. The law reveals our guilt, but God's love always reveals grace. Now think about it. Look what he does next. Does he say, okay? Does he say, hey, you know what? What you're engaged in is all right. Don't worry about it. You know, everything's going to be okay. 
That's not what he said. I want you to look at this very closely. He didn't condemn her, but he did bring her to the fact to say what you're doing is wrong. He says this, neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, this is in verse 13, 11. He says, go and from now on do not sin anymore. Go, go, and from now on do not sin anymore anymore. I think what's interesting about this, he didn't say, hey, what you're doing is okay. He didn't say, hey, that's who you are. Hey, that's how you're designed. That's how God created you. So please continue to live out in this dysfunctional life, this, this broken identity that's just wreaking havoc within your life and making you miserable. Please go ahead and live that way because that's okay. I still love you. That's not what he's saying. He didn't bring condemnation but he pointed to it to say, go and sin no more. Just like you and I. He didn't say it's okay. Just like you and I. Hey, you've got a battle with pornography. Just, just, just try hard. Just, just try to knock it off. Just, just try not to, to, to look at things. Just try. Just try. You have a battle with overeating. You're looking to eat, you're looking to food to, 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 to soothe you. That's how you, that's how you self-medicate. Just, you're, it's okay. It's okay. Just try not to do that. Or you struggle with gossiping. Hey, you know what? Just try not to do it as much. Just try not to do it. That's not what God ever says. There's a sense of urgency here. There's a sense of urgency where God, Jesus says, God, Jesus, God being Jesus, Jesus says, go. Go. There's a sense of urgency. Go, and as you're going, sin no more. Knock it off. Stop sinning. It's only bringing havoc within your life. He's bringing light into this. He's exposing things. And that's the third thing that I want to share with you is that the light always reveals our hope. Jesus isn't condemning, but He's saying there's hope here. I do bring you forgiveness, but I'm going to bring you light. I'm going to bring you freedom. If we would jump down in, in verse 12 and begin to talk, uh, read those verses, Jesus then goes on, not to this woman, but He goes on to exclaim, I am the light of the world. I am am the light. And here's the, fa here's the, here's the cool thing about this. And uh, I love the way Greg uh, or Craig Crochelle uh, talks about this. He says, God didn't bring condemnation uh, but to her, but at this moment, he was no longer the light of the world, but he was the light of her world. And again, this is, uh, this is kind of a little foreshadowing here, but he was going to be the light of, he actually became the light of of her world, just say like he wants to be the light of our worlds. That is what it's all about. The law reveals our guilt. We're incredibly guilty. We're broken. We're still in process. We sin from time to time. Don't miss that. But until we see ourselves as broken individuals that need a Savior on a continual basis, we're not going to see the importance of a Savior. We're not going to see the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what? But His love reveals God's grace. He doesn't condemn. He gives us God's grace and He loves us. And His light reveals the hope that we have in Him. Do you see why this isn't black and white? Do you see, this wasn't black and white. It wasn't, yeah, stoner or, yeah, just let her off the hook. That wasn't it at all. There is a spot in the middle where Jesus says, I'm not condemning you. I'm not condemning you, but I'm saying go and sin no more. Okay? Jesus brought light to her life. Jesus brought didn't bring condemnation, but He brought grace and forgiveness and love, just like He wants to do with us. Are you in need of a Savior? Do you recognize your need uh, for a Savior uh, as we look at this? Are you seeing the hope that we have in Jesus? Not that Jesus is coming to condemn us, and not that He's saying that everything's okay, but He's saying, He's shining light on it. He's saying, I am here to give you hope. I am here to give you grace and love and mercy and forgiveness. And I'm also here through the power of my Holy Spirit to give you, to give you, um, to give you strength, to give you power, to, to live a life that's free of these things and that enables you to live a life of freedom that's full of grace and hope uh, in Him. I don't know where you're at, but I pray that, that um, you recognize the need for a Savior on a daily basis. You recognize the need for His love and His grace and that you extend that even to other people. Spend some time, as I always say, spend some time going back this week, looking over this, pas this passage. What a powerful story that doesn't end in condemnation. It doesn't end in no hope, but instead it ends in incredible amounts of hope. It doesn't deny the guilt. It doesn't deny the sin. 
sinned. It doesn't excuse the sin, but it gives an incredible amount of hope and grace and love, just like Jesus always does. I hope you have a great week. Please spend some time looking at this passage of Scripture and then continue on where Jesus does talk about the light of the world. It was great worshiping with you. Hope to see you back here next week to exalt Jesus uh, once again. name.